We'll make your way over to uh, Exodus chapter 20. As you know, we've been working our way through the book of Exodus, and we have decided that Exodus is, is not the end of the story, and it's not the beginning of the story. It is the continuation of the story that goes all the way through to Deuteronomy. And we've decided that from 19, chapter 19 of Exodus to Numbers 10, it's mostly about God laying down and stipulating what it meant to enter into covenant with Him. So we got to the Ten Commandments, and we've worked through all the way down to, to verse 8. And uh, I think that that's what we'll take care of tonight. So if you will, I will start in verse 1, and I will read down um, to verse 11, if you'll let me. If you found Exodus 20, verse 1, say Amen. amen. And the Lord spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself any carved image, any, light, any likeness of anything that is above, in heaven above, or is in earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow to them, nor serve them. For I, your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation to those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold guiltless uh, who takes his name in vain. Verse 8, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do your work, but on the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, your female servant, nor your cattle, nor strangers who... Uh, in, within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, and the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the seventh day and hallowed it. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your consistency, Lord. I am always amazed, Lord, how you uh, bring things from one part of the Bible to the other, uh, and a gentle flow, Lord, that uh, reminds us and tugs at our hearts, Lord. And, and this idea of this day being holy, this idea of there being rest dedicated to you, Lord, is, uh, is something, Lord, that we can find through the Old Testament and goes on to, into the New Testament, Lord. It's the reason that uh, some folks went into captivity, and it's the reason that uh, uh, some people have... Uh, uh, gotten in trouble today, Lord, because they're, they're all about work and not about rest, Lord. And uh, so we ask you to take this time together, Lord, and help us figure this out. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So when you think about this, the Bible's pretty clear that uh, the reason we have the Sabbath is because God built it into that week a day of sacredness. Again, it's not that he stopped work because he was tired. A better word may be ceased from his labor. Because God doesn't expend energy the way you and I expend energy, so he doesn't need to rest. But he did take in one day out of seven and dedicate it to a day where we recognize that, that uh, we owe him something, and we recognize that we need to rest our bodies and rest our minds and rest our soul. And to add a, not only a family component to it, to a, but a spiritual component. Now, when we think about this, from Adam to Joseph, there is no mention of a seventh day rest. And as far as the early church was concerned, uh, Jesus was resurrected on the eighth day and still taking the Saturday or the Sunday, the early church, those who were involved in Jewish church, took both the Sabbath, and then on the next day, they celebrated Easter every Sunday, right? That's the day Jesus got up. And then as the church moved out from Judaism into the Gentile areas, uh, the Sabbath wasn't so important, so they dropped the Sabbath, and they made Sunday that day that we make heaven. And... I don't think that we can hold up to the idea that it needs to be a certain day, but one day in our week, we should dedicate it to something sacred and, and to hollow it. So here we are from Adam to Joseph. Nobody mentions it. 
They come out of Egypt. They get into the Sinai Desert. Uh, they're, they're at that mountain. Uh, they are worshiping. God has put a, 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 a warning against touching anything. The cloud is down. Moses is talking. God is delivering His Word. These people are entering into covenant with them. They're just at the very beginning of what it meant. And remember, the, the, the obedience that He is desiring for this people to keep has come after the deliverance that He has provided and bringing them out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of bondage. So He's announced Himself as the King. He's over this vassal state, if you will. The reason he's over the vassal state or has the right to be the king of kings for this particular group of people is because he has been the great deliverer. He has heard their prayers. He has delivered them, not just a little bit, but after crossing the Red Sea and it crushing Pharaoh's army, pursuing army, he has put them in such a position that no one is trying to carry them back into bondage anymore. So they're in a good place. They've already agreed to do whatever the Lord has said for them to do. So here it is, keeping the seventh day. Imagine what that meant. Here they were in bondage. Here they were in slaves, slavery. And somebody finally tells them, hey, y'all got a day off. <laughs> right? For, for, for ever and ever, you know, they were not fed the best in the world. They were not given more nourishment than they needed as slaves, but just enough so they could go back and carry out work. And they had to work in order to eat. You know, it's a shame that this day and time we don't tie that to some of the funding that comes from our government. We would see a little bit better response and a little bit more taken care of. But nevertheless, that's what they had to do. And these were hard taskmasters. But now they get out into the wilderness and God begins to establish the seventh. And remember how he does that. He says, you know, I'm going to send down manna from heaven. You're going to gather it for six days. And if you try to get too much of it and carry it into the next day, it's not going to last. It's going to mold and rot on you. It's going to turn into worms. But there's going to be a miracle that happens for you on the seventh day. Because I don't want you to have to go out there scrounging for your food. On that sixth day, you can collect enough food for the, the sixth day and the Sabbath day, and it will last you until the first day comes again, so you don't have to work. So even in the establishment of this day of rest, God provides in it a miracle of provision. And when we begin to look at that miracle of provision, we think, wow, for this group of Hebrew slaves who are now trying to form a nation and get things together, this had to be something absolutely uh, incredible for them. A day when they begin to, to cease labor. But, you know, as being what people do, they begin not only just to cease labor, but they begin to try to legislate what labor was and what labor was not. So the time that Jesus comes around, he has to remind them that the Sabbath was made for man, but not man for the Sabbath. It was made for man to take that time off to himself. It was made for man to come contemplate his position in the universe and was made for him to, to take time and, and do something spiritual and religious and have a moment with his Lord and have a moment with his family. We have gotten in this idea of this time uh, that uh, there's a difference between quality and quantity and as it applies to time. We all want to have a quality time with each other. The time that we spend together, we want it to really matter. We're not going to spend a very long time. We're not going to put a lot of quantity in it, right? But we do want it to be quality. That's why when we go to meetings, we have agendas, right? We don't want to just run from one subject to another in the middle of a meeting. We want to have quality time. We don't want to spend all our times in meetings. So we place an agenda so that the time we have there is quality time. One rabbi, speaking about this, uh, decided to do a survey with his nine-year-old girl. And he said, would you rather have me one hour, uh, one day a week, all to yourself, no interruptions, and you could do whatever you want to do in that one hour, quality time, or would you rather have me have me here three hours a day, and I would be in my study, and occasionally you could come in and interrupt me. He said, the answer surprised her. 
surprised him. He said, the little girl says, I'd rather have the three hours where I could come in and you could listen to me play the piano and I would know you were in the house and I could interrupt you occasionally than I would rather be sitting in front of you for just an hour. Because what really matters in time is just how much of it you devote to something. Think about this. Not only did God create the, the seventh day and ask us to keep it holy, but He's also created the other six days that go with it. See, man can craft all kinds of things, right? Man can craft buildings. We've talked about foundations uh, recently, uh, temples, uh, medicines, vaccine. Men can craft a lot of things. They can manufacture stuff, but God is the only one who can create time. The saying has been attributed to Ben Franklin that time is money. Well, the problem with that is it just shows what's going on in our life. We're all after the almighty dollar, right? And what it ends up doing is it cheapens our times and put more emphasis on the money we make, how much value we have, how much time we have. And it cheapens time. Really and truly, the saying should be that, that, that time is priceless. You never get that bad. And if you're going to be a good steward of the seventh day's time, or your seventh day time, or that day you decide to make holy unto the Lord, if you're going to be a steward of that time, you need to be mindful to be a steward of every other day and all the time that is involved in that because you never get that time back. And you think to yourself, well, people look at me and I need to be busy. There are people who are absolutely guilty of, of working way too much. Diane feels like if she's not doing something at the house, uh, that she's missing something. She's just busy. busy. It's hard to get my wife to sit down at the end of the day knowing she's already worked all day. It, it's just, it, it tires me watching her do the things she does. Fortunately for me, I have a strong constitution, so I'm able to bear what I'm seeing with my eyes, or else it would sadden me greatly. She, uh, she has this idea that she must be doing something 24-7. And I tell you, sometimes some of the best things you can do is just sit there by yourself in your own mind. And people say, well, you're being lazy. You don't know. I can take a piece of scripture and commit it to memory and I can work on it every day, all day long. That's how I, I do my, what am I going to preach on? Well, I take that piece of scripture and I say, well, that's the scripture I'm going to work on. It goes into mind. Over the week, I'll read some commentaries. I'll get some thought on it. But I may never pick up the Bible to look at that piece of scripture again because I'm meditating and I'm ruminating on it. Sunday mornings is that I'm, I'm really quiet on Sunday mornings. Diane doesn't talk to me at all. And it's not because... I hate her. She just knows that I'm running through a sermon the whole time. I'm in there in front of the mirror shaving and I'm talking to y'all like y'all pack up. And I'm trying to get y'all right with every word I'm saying. And I'm shaving and dying. said, who are you talking to? And I said, to them. They everywhere. And they need to hear what God's got to say this morning. I'm getting old. Right? And so it's the idea of, of not doing nothing. Best time in the world, anybody, riding the lawnmower. Eh? What is more fun than riding on the lawnmower? Something about riding that lawnmower and the, and the sound that my club cadet m makes, I sound just like Elvis Presley when I sing. <laughs> so when I'm worshiping God on that lawnmower, having a great time, hallelujah, it is like the king is praising the king. My lip goes to trembling a little bit. I'm telling you, those are time. And some people look at that and say, that's a waste of time. I'm not wasting my time. I'm multitasking. I'm worshiping my God. And I'm getting that grass beat down one more time. When I get off of there, I am tired because I have worked my soul and I have worked my mind and I've worked my body in that time. But not only is it a time for reflection with the Lord, it is a time to spend with your family. It is all right. It is all right to be with your family. 
It is all right to make those times very special. Now, we, we watch Blue Blood. Um, we don't miss an episode. Diane loves it. I look a lot like Tom Selleck did when he was younger. And, uh, <laughs> and she loves it. She loves it. And I, I, I like it. You know, it's usually a pretty good storyline. And, and the Reagans are always going to win in the end at the, most episodes. But what is, what, is, what is wonderful about their Sunday? What happens on Sunday in that house? They eat together. They have a family dinner every Sunday, and they've made rules where you, you can't miss it. It's important to be there. And whether it's a good week that they're all having fun with each other, or whether it's a bad week and they're all upset at one another, they're sitting there at that table making time. And I'm telling you, when growing up, that's what we did, right? We all ate Sunday lunch together. Now, I and Diane have, have uh, unless the kids are around, we, we kind of all, every man for himself. But it's still good to see the family come together. What better time to do that than Sunday afternoon? Hey, I got one for you. You want to take a rest? It is absolutely all right to take a nap on Sunday. No guilt in that. Now, somebody might be mad at you because you took it on Monday. They may be upset at you because you took it on Saturday. But I won't let nobody say nothing about a Sunday nap because it's just holy. It's what gets me going. It's what warms me up. That's what I look forward to. That, that is a, a great time. And I don't feel any guilt about it. I don't feel one guilt about it. I have work. Right? I look at my schedule and I'm bivocational and by the time I get to answering all the questions for work and doing all the work at work and then getting all the texts from church and doing all that, handling the, the other stuff. Now I'm not complaining. We had a funeral yesterday. We did that. Uh, you know, just a lot of things. Today was a little busy with, it, with the text with some stuff going on. Uh, but you know, I put in a, a lot of hours. Part of me keeping the day holy is taking that nap and just thanking the Lord that I'm, I'm able to be there. Knowing that, that if I go to sleep in that chair that day and I don't get up, to be absent in the body is to be present with the... And if I do get up, I'm going to get to come see y'all. I'm a winner either way. <laughs> If I go or if I stay, as the old song goes. So, it is very, very important. A lot of people uh, inflate the time they spend doing work, right? A lot of people, if they really are true with, with their ideas, there was a survey done uh, a few years ago. It's a dated survey, but it was the most recent one I could come up with. Uh, uh, they asked a thousand people how many hours they put in to work, right? The more hours we put in to work, obviously the more valuable we are, right? And then they ask them to be truthful about it. And each one of them decided that they actually spent less time at work than what they had originally said they did because they knew it was important for them to say a big number or people wouldn't think that they were important. We've taken the idea of working nine to five and we we made drones out of people with that. Well, they've got a nine to five job, punch in, clock out. It's just tedious and at work, and you know it's not something to be looking forward for. But it's all right to work. God's ordained work. Said work was good, but He also said the Sabbath, the seventh day of rest, was important for us. It's important for us religiously. It's important for us spiritually. It's important for us. Uh, physically and mentally, and it's important for our families. And we need to remember that, that not only the Lord said that, that uh, we shouldn't do any labor, but He says our sons and our daughters and our male servants and our female servants and even our cattle and the stranger who is within our gate get a day off. And you think to yourself, what about all those people who work on Sunday? I mean, it used to be you couldn't go anywhere and do anything when I was growing up on Sunday. If you didn't have it by Saturday night about 9 o'clock, you wasn't getting it out of Forest, Mississippi on Sunday. It just it wasn't going to happen for you. That, you know, maybe a gas station open, but uh, they, you know, now the grocery stores are open. 
All the fast food places are open. You think, well, if nobody was there to do the business, they would close. And I say to you, you know, well, they still deserve rest. It's not good for them. We used to have blue laws, right? Now a lot of counties, even in this state, no longer have blue laws. You can still go in and you can get your liquor and go do whatever it was you want to do that same day. But when I, I was growing up, sometime between uh, ser uh, Saturday midnight and Sunday morning, somebody would take a long, old, thick nylon cord and run it all the way through from one uh, beer cooler to the next. Don't open it up. We're not going to sell it to you. Think about what we've substituted worship for God with. We've talked about this before and what it's done to devastate our, our churches and our communities, right? Again, growing up, we didn't have any activities on Wednesday night that interfered with children going to church on Wednesday night. We certainly didn't plan for some tournament to be. Now, we may play softball Sunday afternoon. We might play volleyball. We might even have an organized church league, but that started at this time and ended at that time so we could all go to church that morning and we could all go back to church that night. Now we have people who leave Friday night with their children to be somewhere Saturday morning, many miles away, and if those teams keep winning, then they keep playing, and they have stuff slotted at 8 o'clock on Sunday morning. Well, where should those kids be? Where should those parents be? What's more important, right? We substituted sports for the sacred. Yeah. And what's it cost us? Absolutely everything that's important. There's no respect for God. There's no respect for our parents. There's no respect for our organized religion. There's no respect for your elders. And you can see that. And we live in a miserable world where uh, lies are told over and over and over again. And people would rather believe the lie than the truth. And I think the Bible speaks to that being one of the signs of the end of time. But why can't they find truth? Because they're not setting where truth is. We've talked about it before. We, we do everything else. And then if there's absolutely nothing else to turn our cord or ring our bell, if there's nothing else out there, then we'll think about going to church. And then we'll probably end up missing Sunday school. And then we'll probably end up being late for church. And I think to myself, well, you know, there's no excuse for that. How many times do you walk in late for work? Come in, you know what time we start. I, we've started the same time ever since I walked in the front doors here six, seven years ago. No need of it. I, 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 I and Randy Rose live the, the farthest away on the other side of the county, and, and we're going to get here, right? We're talking about folks who just live over yonder. Can't get here. And then you say, well, Brother Tony, don't say it. If they see that, they're going to stop coming. I'm, I'm telling you, if they don't respect the Sabbath and they don't respect God's Word and it shows in what effort it, they put in to come here, then maybe they need to reevaluate what's going on anyway. I think if we get back to finding these things as being important, what the Bible says is important, what God has ordained is important, I think we'll be at a better place not only in this church but in our community and in our nation as well. Again, it talks in verse 11 about how God made the earth and heaven and seas. And notice man was created on day six, right? We stand between all creation and God's rest. All of creation and God's rest is what we stand between. He rested the seventh day. Again, he doesn't expend energy like you and I do. He spoke these things into existence. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. It's important to him. And I want you to know something. If it's important to him, and he's built in a sacredness to it, then it should be important to us. 
sacred to us. And again, it's hard to, to legislate what holiness is and legislate what a day of rest looks like. But somehow or another, it needs to include time with your Lord. For us, it needs to include time with our fellow Christians and our family. And I'm happy. That's all I know about that.